Andy, do you feel that the public has insulted your art? Uh, no. Why not? Uh, well, I hadn't thought about it. It doesn't bother you at all, then? Uh, no. Well, do you think that they've shown a lack of appreciation for what pop art means? Uh, no. Andy, do you think that pop art has sort of reached the point where it's becoming repetitious now? Uh, yes. in 1962, right after Marilyn Monroe's death. By the 1960s, Marilyn's film career as a sex symbol was all but over. Warhol would effectively immortalise Marilyn as the sex symbol of the 20th century. The seductive blonde Marilyn with the heavy-lidded eyes and parted lips is frozen in time. She is transformed into the personification of the allure and glamour of Hollywood's golden age. Both Warhol and Marilyn understood transformation. She was an abused foster child from the rural Midwest who transformed herself into Hollywood royalty. And he was a shy, sickly, effeminate child of working class immigrants who transformed himself into the most famous and most controversial artist of his generation. Marilyn would make Warhol a household name and Warhol would make Marilyn an icon. Pop art came out of the post-war consumer boom, a time of mass media and mass production. Advertising pushed televisions, new cars, washing machines and convenience foods. People were bombarded with image after image and art needed to reflect that. Pop art was inspired by popular culture and artists like Roy Lichtenstein and Andy Warhol used instantly accessible images to reach mass audiences. Their art would blur the boundaries of high art and low culture. It was in many ways a reaction against abstract expressionism, the dominant artistic movement in the United States in the 1950s. While abstract impressionists like Jackson Pollock produced spontaneous, personal and emotional work, pop artists were producing depersonalised, objectified and representational work. Warhol had already produced two of what would become iconic pop art works, but Marilyn Diptych, he produced just four months after her death, would cement his reputation as the Prince of Pop Art. Warhol was an early adopter of the silkscreen printmaking process. He totally radicalised the art market by erasing a concept so important to Western art, uniqueness and originality. While Warhol didn't invent the photographic silkscreen process, he developed his own technique by combining hand-painted backgrounds with photographic silkscreen printed images to create unique works of art. As an illustrator in the 1950s, Warhol had already started to work with repetition and a forerunner to printing, his blotted line technique, which became his signature style. He would use tracing paper to allow him to create multiple images from the same drawing. He would first trace his original drawing with ink in small sections so it stayed wet, then blot it onto absorbent paper, making a copy. Then he would fill in various copies using ink washes. Silk screens are photographically exposed to the image to make a stencil. Then artists transfer their artworks by pushing ink through the mesh using a squeegee onto various surfaces, including paper and fabric. One colour is printed at a time, so several screens must be used to produce a multicoloured image. It gives the artist the opportunity to repeatedly reproduce the same image. Marilyn Diptych is made up of two canvases painted silver. He then silk screens a photograph of Marilyn 50 times. The images on the left have five colours of underpaint, pink, white, blue and orange, all unified on both sides with a final layer of black. We must remember that it would have been easy enough for Warhol to make a crisp, clean image, but the bleeding of the ink, the overlapping colours 
and the ghostly grey images are deliberate choices. Andy Warhol loved celebrities and was infatuated with movie stars. He grew up poverty-stricken in Pittsburgh during the Depression. Obsessed with fame and celebrity at an early age, he would escape by devouring movie magazines and writing fan letters to movie stars. At 13, he wrote to Shirley Temple and received this signed photo, later found in his childhood scrapbook. The pose and the colour tinting of the photo may well have influenced his images of Marilyn. Later, in the mid-1950s, when he was a well-known shoe illustrator, he would name his shoes after celebrities. But instead of choosing an image from 1962, the year she died, he chose a publicity still from 10 years before. By using this image, he portrayed Marilyn at the peak of her beauty and her youth, and the peak of her fame. Marilyn is forever frozen in perfect cinematic beauty. Warhol always thought he was ugly. His insecurities were rooted in his sickly childhood and exacerbated by premature baldness, pockmarked skin, prominent nose and later scarring from gunshot wounds. His art examined what constituted beauty. Marilyn Diptych is not an idealised beauty or perfect image. Her face doesn't quite match to the gaudy colour behind it. He is questioning the idea of perfection. Warhol understood the superficial nature of beauty and celebrity. Publicity images like these are created by marketing companies to sell a product, a film, but in reality say little about the person behind the image. The silkscreen technique has the effect of flattening her face, both figuratively and emotionally. Marilyn Monroe, a manufactured star with a made-up name, is reduced to a vacant facade and the artist is a machine, churning out manufactured images like a Hollywood film studio. The repetition of the image suggests billboard posters, or advertising, or more appropriately, a photographer's contact sheet. Repeating Marilyn turns her face into an eerie, inanimate death mask, and if one image is powerful, then 50 dead Marilyns are 50 times more powerful. Missiles in Cuba add to an already clear and present danger. In 1962, when Warhol was painting Marilyn, tensions were rising between the US and the Soviet Union, and the Cuban Missile Crisis would feed into Warhol's obsession with death. Death was a subject that would haunt and fascinate him all his life. From his father's premature death, his own poor health as a child, his shooting in 1968, to the AIDS epidemic. At the same time he painted Marilyn, he was also starting a series of works called the Death and Disaster series. This is a group of around 70 loosely connected works that included images taken from newspapers and police reports, depicting car accidents, electric chairs, suicides and plane crashes. His paintings of Marilyn Monroe shortly after her death and Jackie Kennedy following the assassination of President John F. Kennedy can be seen in relation to this series. Marilyn's death hangs over this image. On the left, her garishly made up face makes us think of an embalmed corpse, while the fading images on the right make it seem like she is disappearing before our eyes, suggesting her death by suicide. The painting is not actually celebrating Monroe as an icon, but is rather a warning of the fatal consequences of fame. Warhol, guru of pop art, has died in New York. Andy Warhol shocked society more than any other artist, but he saved his greatest shock for after his death. When he died, it was revealed that despite being a symbol of American counterculture, Warhol was in fact a devout but closeted Byzantine Catholic who went to church to pray most days and kept an altar with a crucifix and a prayer book on his bedside table. Not only was a supposedly cynical business artist a devout Catholic, but he secretly worked in New York soup kitchens. He spent most of his life living with his mother, Julia, a Slovakian immigrant who spoke little English and was also a devout Catholic. A church-going mother's boy did not really fit the Studio 54 party-goer image he cultivated. His father died prematurely 
but Julia was possibly the greatest influence in his life. She had decorated his childhood home with her own folk art and homemade religious icons. She not only encouraged his religious side as a child, but she also pushed his artistic side. Despite being so poor, she bought him his first camera at nine years old and bought him regular art supplies. Later, she moved with him to New York, cleaned his apartment, cooked for him and prayed with him every morning before he left the house. Along with dreams of movie stars, the young Andy Warholers only other escape from poverty was the church. It would lead to Warhol's two childhood passions, religion and celebrity, being fused together for his first Marilyn, who he would depict as an icon and an object of worship. Like the Catholic cult of the Virgin Mary, women haunted his art. He idolised women, who appear as remote superhuman beauties, martyrs even. Judy Garland, Jackie Kennedy, Grace Kelly, Edie Sedgwick and others were transformed into deities. His friend, Bob Colicello, would describe Warhol as a religious artist for a secular society. As a child, he attended mass at their church, where they would conduct the service in Old Slavonic and always started with an exorcism of the devil. It is here where he would spend hours in front of the monumental iconostasis, which is a wall that separated the nave from the sanctuary. It was essentially a grid of portraits of the saints. The young Warhol would contemplate the isolated figures of saints floating on gilded gold, stacked repeatedly across the screen. It was here that his visual language was formed. The highly stylized Byzantine icons were a huge influence on Warhol. There is the block colours and the flatness, the lack of depth, but there is also the actual method of manufacture. Icons were often made using stencils, echoing Warhol's future screen printing process. Mass icon production meant they were also made by a team of anonymous artists, something he would later mimic with his assembly line method of production. He often expressed the desire to be like a machine, and icon painters were considered machines of God. The Marilyn diptych explicitly references a form of Christian painting. A diptych is usually a small portable autopiece on two hinged wooden panels, used to spread Christianity to the illiterate masses. With his background in advertising, Warhol understood visuals. I never read, he once said, I just look at pictures. It is no surprise then that a contemporary artist raised in the Catholic Slavic ghettos of Pittsburgh would use familiar religious symbolism and apply it to celebrity, America's newest faith. From early on in his career, Andy Warhol had an extraordinary ability of finding the sacred in the profane. Like so many successful Americans, he was a product of the Eastern European immigrant experience, who himself became an icon. A shy, gay, working class man who became the court painter of the 1970s. An artist who embraced consumerism, celebrity and the counterculture and changed modern art in the process. He anticipated our fascination with brands, celebrities, even selfies. His line about everyone being famous for 15 minutes feels even more true in the 21st century. Above all, Warhol was a chronicler of modern life. Marilyn Diptych is perhaps his greatest canvas, bringing together celebrity, death and exposure. It is both a warning and a love letter to America. Warhol, who is often criticised as vacuous or superficial, produced art that is profoundly subversive and quite simply a perfect mirror for our times. Andy Warhol and Marilyn Monroe were both the embodiment of the American dream. They also projected a vacant persona that made sure nobody knew the real person behind the mask. What we do know is that Warhol had the very rare ability to share what he saw with all of us. He redefined art, what art can be, what art can mean, who has access to art, who can make art and whose voice matters. 
he democratized the very notion of art making 